Welcome to section three of Reproductive Anatomy. In this section, we will discuss the important structures of the pelvic floor. Let's get started. Here is a table summarizing the structures we will address in this lecture. The urethral sphincters, the anal sphincter, the levator ani muscles, the perineal body, and the pudendal nerve. Let's start with the urethral sphincters. So there are two. There is an internal and an external. The internal one is made of smooth muscle, and it's an extension of the detrusor muscle of the bladder. And since it's smooth muscle, it's controlled by autonomic nerves, which means it's involuntary. Here is a sagittal view of the female pelvis, and we can see the bladder right here. I'll just write a B for short. And here we have labeled the urethra. The internal would be up here, and the external would be down here. And just picture the internal, this one right here, as being a continuation of this detrusor muscle of the bladder. Now let's go back to this table. An important clinical tie-in for the urethral sphincters is pelvic organ prolapse, specifically cystocele. Now, pelvic organ prolapse and cystocele was discussed in the previous lecture, and cystocele means that the bladder is protruding posteriorly into the vaginal wall. And when this happens, the urethral sphincters get weak, and this can lead to stress incontinence. And this is the pelvic organ prolapse slide we introduced in the previous lecture, and I just want to point out an important part of this slide. If the urethral sphincter is ever involved in this pathology, then the patient will experience stress incontinence. Now what does stress incontinence mean? This means that any abdominal pressure will lead to the leakage of urine. And this abdominal pressure can come in the form of coughing or the Valsalva maneuver. Looking at our image for pelvic organ prolapse, notice that if the bladder presses into the vaginal wall, the internal urethral sphincter can be disrupted. So right here we have the cystocele, and the bladder, right here, is pushing posteriorly into the wall of the vagina, and this will disrupt the internal urethral sphincter. And by disruption, I mean that it simply won't close properly. So when pressure increases in the cavity, the sphincter will simply open, providing no resistance to the pressure. Now let's discuss the anal sphincter. In terms of pelvic organ prolapse, the anal sphincter follows a very similar principle to the urethral sphincters. It surrounds the anus, so if there's increased pressure, then the anal sphincter will be weak, leading to fecal incontinence, which is rare. More likely, the patient will have constipation. The top right image demonstrates a rectocele. When the rectum pushes anteriorly, like this, bulging into the posterior vaginal wall, the patient may experience constipation. In fact, sometimes patients find that they need to place their finger in the vagina and push backward against the posterior vaginal wall in order to release the stool. And as mentioned on the previous slide, a rectocele can also lead to a weak anal sphincter, leading to fecal incontinence. However, it's much more likely that the patient will experience constipation. Looking again at our sagittal view, we can see the external anal sphincter right here. So if the rectum is protruding anteriorly in pelvic organ prolapse, then the external anal sphincter cannot perform its proper function. Now here is an inferior view of the pelvis. Notice we have the external anal sphincter labeled right here. And if there's rectocele, pelvic organ prolapse, then this sphincter will be weak. Now let's do a question to apply what you've learned so far. A 78-year-old female has been experiencing unintentional loss of stool. She is diagnosed with pelvic organ prolapse. Is the anterior or posterior wall of the vaginal canal more likely to collapse inward during the Valsalva maneuver? And what sphincter is most likely dysfunctional? Now recall that in pelvic organ prolapse, increased abdominal pressure can disrupt important sphincters. And the sphincters you should be thinking about are the urethral sphincters and the anal sphincter. And we're told that she has unintentional loss of stool so fecal incontinence, which makes us think that the anal sphincter is what's disrupted. So that answers the second part of the question. The first part of the question asks, is the anterior or the posterior wall of the vaginal canal more likely to collapse inward during this increased abdominal pressure, or valsalva? Well, we know that the rectum is located posteriorly to the vaginal canal, so it's the posterior part that's collapsing inward. Once again, this shows rectocele, so it's the posterior vaginal wall that's collapsing inward. And what's likely dysfunctional is this anal sphincter. Now let's talk about the levator ani muscles. These are located on the pelvic floor, and they support the pelvic organs. And since they support the pelvic organs, if there's damage or weakness, this can lead to pelvic organ prolapse. So we can see the anus, and we can see the vaginal canal. And the levator ani muscles have fibers running anterior and posterior. You can see them right here. And looking from this perspective, it's much easier to see that these muscles are so important for support of the pelvic floor. So, if the levator ani muscles are weak, the patient can have pelvic organ prolapse. Going back to this slide, we can see that the levator ani muscles are important supporting structures for the pelvis. Also notice, of the three supporting structures listed here, the levator ani muscles are the only ones that are muscles. The other two are ligaments. And this is a very important point. And that's because muscles, unlike ligaments, can be strengthened through exercise. 
and the specific exercise that I'm talking about here are the Kegel exercises. So what's the point I'm trying to make here? Well, if a patient has stress incontinence from pelvic organ prolapse, you could recommend Kegel exercises. As written here, Kegel exercises can reduce stress incontinence from prolapse. Next, let's discuss the perineal body. This is located on the pelvic floor, and it's fibromuscular tissue between the vagina and the rectum. Right here, again, we see the vaginal canal, and we see the rectum. Connecting the two is the perineal body. Now, what's so significant about this area? Well, during an episiotomy, the doctor can transect this area. And an episiotomy is a way to increase the size of the vaginal canal to allow for passage of the infant. So this fibromuscular tissue right here can be cut. Now let's do a question to apply what you've learned so far. A 35-year-old pregnant female at 37 weeks gestation presents to the hospital with spontaneous labor. The physician is concerned the vaginal opening is stretching and tearing to a degree that warrants an episiotomy. The episiotomy is performed, but continued stretching during labor causes tissue damage posteriorly. What anatomical structure or structures may be torn as a result of the tear? Recall that in an episiotomy, the perineal body is what's transected. And if there's continued stretching and damage posteriorly, what region are we referring to? Looking at this image, we can see that the perineal body lies anterior to the anal sphincter, which means that continued tearing posteriorly can damage that sphincter. And that answers the question. What structure can be torn as a result of the tear? The anal sphincter. However, that's not the only structure that can be damaged. Looking at this sagittal view, we can see that the perineal body, labeled right here, if torn, can actually damage the rectum as well. So you should be thinking of the anal sphincter and the rectum, and that answers the question. The last item to discuss is the pudendal nerve. This nerve originates from the S2 to S4 spinal nerve levels, and it innervates the structures of the pelvic floor, those items we found on this table. And because it innervates these structures, it can be targeted by anesthesia in order to decrease pain. This would be called a pudendal nerve block. Notice this image highlights the pudendal nerve. Notice that it reaches down and clearly innervates the pelvic floor. For this reason, the pudendal nerve can be anesthetized for pelvic procedures. And this is called a perineal nerve block or a pudendal nerve block. So from this table, we've talked about everything you need to know about the pelvic floor in order to rock the boards. So that concludes this section.